So coronary circulation is responsible for ensuring that the heart has enough oxygen to meet its metabolic demands. Understanding the anatomy and physiology of this circulation is important, especially when it comes to evaluating EKGs, as well as understanding coronary artery disease and the interventions for that and myocardial infarction. So with that said, let's talk coronary circulation. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. All right, you guys, and as a quick reminder, there's just about two weeks left to pre-order your spot in ICU Advantage Academy. So by pre-ordering, you're going to get lifetime access to these videos here without any ads playing, all the lesson notes, as well as audio-only versions of each lesson. The best part, though, is you're actually going to be able to earn CE credit for doing this education and watching these lessons, which is great, and you can really apply that to either your license renewal, CCRM renewal, whatever purpose you have a need for those CE credits. So make sure you guys follow the link down in the description or head over to icuadvantage.com forward slash academy to pre-order while you still can and get that 50% off the lifetime membership. All this before the course launches on March 15th. I'm really excited for this and I look forward to seeing you guys in there. All right, so on to the coronary circulation. So the heart is a muscular pump that requires energy and oxygen in order to function properly. So we have our coronary blood supply, which is essentially the circulation of blood in the blood vessels of the heart. And as you know, there's two primary stages in our cardiac cycle. We have systole, which is obviously where the heart is contracting. And due to these muscle contraction, there's actually no perfusion that's going to be taking place to the heart here. Now, in diastole, this is where we actually have the muscle relaxation of the heart. So here, the aortic valve closes, and then we have retrograde flow of blood coming back down that ascending aorta. That's going to be stopped by those closed aortic valves, but then it's going to perfuse into the coronary arteries, thus going on to perfuse the heart. And so this is important to know because this is actually opposite of how all the other tissues in our body are perfused. They're normally perfused during systole, whereas because of that muscle contraction, the only way we have the opportunity to perfuse the heart is when it's relaxed, which is during diastole. All right, so let's go ahead and start to talk about the anatomy of the coronary vessels. And so up here is an anterior and a posterior view of the heart that we're going to use throughout this lesson. So I do want to just quickly highlight some major structures that we have. So here we have our left atrium is going to be about here, although it's going to be kind of posterior on here. Here is going to be our right atrium, and then we have our right ventricle here, and then part of our left ventricle, which is going to be over here. Now you can also see we've got our superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and our pulmonary arteries. And then we have our arching aorta here, which is going to come down to our aortic valve here. Running both directions from the aorta, we have our atrioventricular sulcus, or grooves, that are running basically the dividing line between our atria and our ventricles. Then running superior to inferior, we also have our interventricular sulcus, or grooves, and we have those both on the anterior here and the posterior surface here. And then looking at the anterior view, we've got our anterior, anterior lateral wall, our apex down here, and then our inferior wall. And then looking at our posterior view, uh, again over on this side. And so here we have the anterior lateral and inferior wall, the posterior side of the heart. Uh, again, our apex is down here. And once again, I, we have our inferior wall down here. All right, so now that we have those major structures out of the way, let's begin to talk about our coronary arteries. So first and foremost, it's really important to know that everyone's anatomy is going to be different and thus their coronary arteries can vary in their location, their size, and even the number of branches of a particular branch that we're going to talk about. I'm going to point out some of the big and common variations, but really know that there can often be many, many more of these. 
All right, so to start off our coronary arteries, it's important to know that there are two main coronary arteries that come off the trunk of our ascending aorta, something that we refer to as the aortic root. So if we take a cross section of this section here and then kind of look down on the aortic valve as if we're looking down through the aorta, we can see our semilunar aortic valve here. And then just above the aortic valve in the sinuses of Valsalva, we actually have our two coronary arteries that come off the aorta here, and then they're going to travel along those respective atrioventricular sulcuses or grooves, something also referred to as the coronary sulcus. So we have the right coronary ostium, which is where our right coronary artery is going to be coming off of, and then we have our left coronary ostium, which is where our left coronary artery is going to be coming off of. And then coming out from here, the coronary arteries do sit on the epicardial surface of the heart. So they're going to be directly under that pericardium. All right, so now back to our diagrams here. Let's start talking about our left coronary artery, which, like I said, is branching off the left side of the aorta. And then we have the first small segment of this, which is something that we also refer to as the left main. Now, typically, the left coronary artery then bifurcates in, or divides into two main branches. First, coming down here, we have what we refer to as the left anterior descending artery, or the LAD. Um, this is also sometimes called the left anterior interventricular artery. And this one travels inferior in that interventricular sulcus, hence the name of that anterior interventricular artery. And this is that groove that goes between our left and right ventricles on the anterior surface. Now coming down the LAD, the first branch we have is actually our first septal perforator branch. And this is actually followed by many more uh, septal branches coming off the LAD. And these are basically what perfuse the interventricular septum. Now coming off on the other side, we start to have our first and then let's say our second diagonal branch here. And we're going to have at least two of these diagonal branches, but we can potentially have many more as well. And these are going to be going out and perfusing the anterior lateral segments of that left ventricle. Then the LAD is going to come down and wrap around the apex. And here it's going to be perfusing some distal apical segments. Now, the other bifurcation coming off the left coronary artery is actually going to be our left circumflex. This is sometimes abbreviated LCX. And this one gets its name because it wraps around the circumference of the heart. And so here it wraps around the left side of the heart, again, in that atrioventricular groove. Now, coming off this, we are going to have the left atrial artery. And this is a small branch that comes off and, as you can guess, perfuses the left atrium. Then our first real branch is actually going to be our first obtuse marginal artery, so our OM1. Um, this also goes by the name left marginal artery. Now this one gets its name because if you remember from geometry, we had those acute and obtuse angles. The angle when we're looking at this anterior view, we have an obtuse angle, hence the name obtuse marginal. Now there can actually be numerous other obtuse marginal branches coming off the left circumflex. Um, typically, again, we're going to have at least two, the OM1 and the OM2, but like I said, there can be many more. Now, the higher or more proximal obtuse marginals are going to be perfusing more of the anterior or lateral parts of the left ventricle, whereas those more distal obtuse marginals are going to be as that circumflex is wrapped around the posterior side of the heart, so these are going to be more inferior lateral and posterior. Now, like I said, typically the left coronary artery bifurcates into two branches, but in some small percentage of the population, we actually have a third branch that comes off. And this comes off actually in between both the circumflex and the LAD. And this, we give it its own separate name, and it's called the ramus. And this one basically serves the same purpose as those high obtuse marginal or high diagonal branches. So here it's going to be perfusing the interior lateral wall. All right, so now let's move on to the right side of the heart, and let's talk about the right coronary artery. So this one obviously comes off the right side of the aorta, and this is going to be supplying the right side of the heart. And this includes the right atrium, right ventricle, as well as our SA and AV nodes. So the first branch that we have coming off the RCA here is actually going to be our conus artery. And this goes out to perfuse the RV outflow tract, as well as portions of the anterior RV wall. 
Interestingly, there is actually a study that suggests a decent percentage of the population actually has this artery as its own branch off the aortic root. Now, continuing along the right coronary artery, we have the sinoatrial nodal artery that comes off, and this is going to perfuse specifically that SA node. 60% um, of the people it comes off of the RCA here, um, otherwise the other percentage of people that this actually comes off the left circumflex. And then from there we have our right atrial branch, which is, as you can guess, again, perfusing the right atrium. Then we have our first real big branch, and this is going to be our acute marginal artery, or also known as the right marginal. So again, we had the obtuse marginal on the other side. So here on this side, remember from geometry class, we've got that acute angle, that small angle, hence this is where it gets its name from. Now here again with our acute marginal, uh, we can have multiple branches of this, but these are going out to perfuse the right ventricle. Now the right coronary artery continues to move along that AV sulcus or that groove, and it's gonna wrap around to the posterior side of the heart. And then we're gonna have another important branch coming off here called the atrioventricular or AV nodal artery. And as you guessed, once again, this one is a branch that goes and perfuses the AV node. And again, this is another one that may actually originate from the left circumflex in some small percentage of people. Now from here, the right coronary artery then bifurcates into two different arteries. We have the right posterior lateral artery, or the RPL, and this one is going to be perfusing the inferior lateral or the posterior lateral wall. And then heading inferiorly towards the apex, we then have the posterior descending artery, or the PDA. Now this one's also known as the posterior interventricular artery uh, because again it travels inferiorly or posterior along that interventricular sulcus on the back side of the heart. And this one is going and perfusing the inferior and posterior wall of the heart, both the right and left ventricle. Now this talking about the PDA actually brings us to an interesting discussion, something that's referred to as dominance. So we can have patients who are either right dominant, left dominant, or co-dominant, and really what this is referring to is where the PDA is coming off of. So in the majority of people, the PDA is actually going to be coming off the right coronary artery like we just talked about. So sometimes we'll refer to this as the RPDA. In a smaller percentage of people, um, we actually can have the PDA that comes off of the left circumflex as it wraps around posteriorly on the heart. Now in these cases here, the right coronary artery then is really limited in some of the stuff that it's uh, supplying. And that left coronary artery takes on a very big responsibility for perfusing a vast majority of the heart. And then in an even smaller percentage of the population, we can have something called co-dominance. And this is where the PDA is, uh, we actually get the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery that come together in sort of an anastomosis and then together form the PDA from there. Now, important to know that the, the coronary arteries do continue to branch further as they dive deeper into that myocardium, uh, working their way towards the endocardium. This deep network of branches is actually something that we refer to as the microcirculation. And so this is where we have our perforator branches that go into our arterioles, which branch further into our capillaries. Now these are unable to be seen on a coronary angiogram as they're really too small to be seen on there. While they are small in size, this microcirculation makes up the greatest portion of the coronary blood supply. And this microcirculation is what's primarily impacted by vasoactive mediators that produce both the vasodilation and the vasoconstriction. All right, so now that we've talked about the coronary arteries, let's actually move on and talk about the coronary veins. So essentially, wherever there's going to be arteries, we're also going to have veins. Now, knowing these coronary veins is really not all that important, but it is pretty easy, so we're just going to review over it pretty quickly here. So to start things off, uh, if we take a look at the posterior side of the heart, let's talk about the coronary sinus. And this is actually a large vessel, like I said, it's located in the posterior part of the heart in that atrioventricular sulcus. And this is basically going to be a final collection point for several of these veins. And then from here, it's going to drain that deoxygenated blood back into the right atrium. All right, so first we're going to have our small cardiac vein. 
And this is going to be returning blood from the right side of the heart that's perfused by the acute marginal or right marginal artery. So it's going to come up along here. Uh, it's going to curve around to the posterior side of the heart along that sulcus, and that's going to join our coronary sinus. Now, next, if we stay looking at the posterior side of the heart, uh, we have our middle cardiac vein. And this is going to be returning blood from the right ventricle that's perfused by the PDA. And so that's going to head up superiorly and again join our coronary sinus. Around here we also have the posterior vein which is going to run along near this middle cardiac vein. This is going to be returning blood from that posterior wall of the left and right ventricles, again perfused by the PDA. And once again that's going to come up and join the coronary sinus. Now if we flip back to the anterior side of the heart, we have our great cardiac vein. So this is returning blood from the left side of the heart, all of that that's being perfused by the LAD. So this is going to come up from the front of the heart, head up along the path of the LAD. It's going to join the right circumflex to wrap around the posterior side of the heart, where it then joins up and drains into the coronary sinus. And then lastly for our veins, we have our anterior vein. And this one actually drains blood from the anterior portion of the right ventricle, as well as the right atrium. Interestingly, this one actually does not join the coronary sinus, and this one drains directly into the right atrium itself. So all the other veins all link up together in that coronary sinus and then drain into the right atrium. The anterior vein, this one specifically drains on its own into the right atrium. All right, and that is the anatomy of our coronary circulation from both our coronary arteries as well as our coronary veins. Knowing these, specifically arteries, is going to be really important uh, as we get into talking in a little bit about our EKGs and some of the areas that are potentially being affected on what we see on that EKG. Before we do dive into that, though, the next lesson, we're going to be talking about some of the physiology that's in play when we're looking at this coronary circulation, so make sure and stay tuned for that next lesson. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. There. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release, otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.